Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He told them how much he loved them and that they ought to learn to wash each other's feet, that they must learn to be givers and not takers, and that they have been chosen to bring the message that he came to bring it to the whole world. He came with a message of compassion and forgiveness, of self-sacrifice and of caring, of building a community on the love of God and the love of each other. And these were very important lessons. And now after supper, he talks about being the vine and they being the branches. When he spoke of being the good shepherd, he was describing himself as the one who guides them, the one who walks beside them. It's a picture of a close, loving relationship. And now when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, he means I am with you and you are with me. And there's no separation. The life of God is with you. The presence of God is with you. Now, if you have your Bibles, please open to John chapter 15 and we'll follow the text. Jesus begins by saying, I am the vine. This is one of Jesus' famous I am statements that we have in John's Gospel, several of them. In the Old Testament, the grape vine was a symbol of Israel, God's chosen people. Just as Paul used the body of Christ or the bride of Christ or the building of God as metaphors for the church, so here in John, we have the imagery of the vine. Jesus affirms that he is what Israel was meant to be. This implies further that because of its relationship to Jesus, the true vine, the community of disciples, is what Israel was meant to be. He then expands the metaphor. Jesus says, my father is the wine dress. Jesus affirms his intimate relationship with the father, at the same time, his subjection to the father's will. He goes on in verse two to say, every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away that it may bear fruit. Fruit bearing is the evidence of salvation. Sorry. And the context indicates that Jesus is making a very important point. Perhaps it would help if we look at this verse together with 15.4, where Jesus tells the disciples, abide in me and I in you. This is actually the first of several references in this passage to the idea of believers needing to abide or to persevere in their faith. Look at verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, and 14. Through salvation, is both an initial and a continuous response. Biblical assurance is linked to perseverance in faith, a lifestyle of repentance, ongoing obedience, and fruit bearing. Now down through church history, there's been a debate on the meaning of the expressions, unless you abide in me, and if a man does not abide in me, that Jesus uses these expressions in verses four and six. What do they mean? Is it really possible not to abide in Christ? And the context helps us to answer these questions. At the very time when our Lord was speaking, there was a glaring example of one who failed to abide in him. Judas Iscariot, who had just left them, Judas was chosen as his 11 colleagues were. Their association with the Lord brought them no privileges which were not equally open to him. And yet, Judas turned his back 
in the Lord Jesus. So the danger of apostasy is real. And the challenge to persevere or abide in the vine must be taken seriously. Now to return to the text, we, we return to the outcome of abiding in Christ. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. And now he's, he says, he talks about being fruitful. The outcome is being fruitful, be fruitfulness. He says, whoever abides in me, in verse 5, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. The continual fellowship, that is the personal relationship, is the source of continual fruit. The context indicates that fruit refers not only to the believer's attitude, but also to their actions, believer's actions. The quality of life is what he's talking about. Believers are promised effective, lasting fruit if they abide. And then Jesus adds, for apart from me, you can do nothing. He, put it, he puts the same point negatively. It's a negative statement of the statement in verse 5 that if you abide, you shall bear fruit. And this is echoed in the well-known verse from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me both sides, the human side as well as the divine. Jesus then makes a further point in verse, when he says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Now the word prunes over here literally means cleanses. It is found only here in the New Testament and is probably chosen by John because John had a liking for words that had more than one connotation. So because of the connotation of pruning and cleansing, John probably used this term. Those of us who enjoy having rose plants in, the, in our gardens, we know that pruning is the secret to having a plant full of blooms. Here in the Negris, if we want our rose plants to bloom in April, May, we need to prune them in November, December. Pruning represents suffering in the believer's lives. And just as the purpose of pruning is to improve the chances of blooming, suffering in our lives has the purpose of fruitfulness. It maximizes fruit bearing, exposes fakes, and keeps us dependent on God. Now, if we remember that John chapter 14 to 17 is all one unit, and here we are looking at chapter 15, which is closer to chapter 13, where we have Jesus washing the disciples' feet, then we can see that there probably is a relationship between pruning, the word pruning over here, and the word cleansing in chapter 13. The disciples were already bathed, which would represent salvation, but their feet needed to be washed, which refers to ongoing continual forgiveness. The first reference in 1 John verse 9, chapter 1 verse 9, seems to confirm, confirm this because it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, John is not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. Because none of us become sinless when we put our faith in Christ. God begins his work in our lives. And that process will only be completed when we are glorified. It's not only obedience that is required for abiding. It is also ongoing repentance. So the purpose of suffering in the life of a believer may have several aspects. It is to develop Christ-likeness. According to Romans chapter 8, he talks about believers being conformed 
the likeness of God's son. It, it may refer to temporal punishment because very often there are consequences of wrongdoing. And it may simply refer to life in a fallen world. We are still part of fallen humanity. Now we have a further point made in verse three. You are already clean, Jesus says, which must be understood in the light of the fact that the term prunes means cleanses. Jesus is referring to the evidence of true discipleship. The term already is emphasized in the original text and underlines to the remaining 11 disciples. Remember, by this time, according to John's narrative, Judas had already left. And the remaining 11 disciples needed to be affirmed in their relationship to Christ. So Jesus says, you are already clean and then explains because of the word that I have spoken to you. The point is further clarified in verse seven. If you abide in me, Jesus says, and my word abides in you. He switches metaphors between he himself abiding in the disciples and his words abiding in them. Jesus reveals his, the Father and so to do his teachings. They are interchangeable sources of revelation. The gospel is both a person and a message. And in the second, verse, second part of verse 7, it says, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You are already clean because my word abides in you. And therefore, if you ask, it will be granted. That's basically what Jesus is saying. His point is that prayer is not automatically answered. It is those who abide in Christ and those in whom he abides that this promise applies. And why that is so is explained in verse 8 when it says, by this, that is by answering the prayer of those who abide in the relationship with Christ, by that, by that answer, God is glorified. The Christ-like living of believers brings glory to God and proves that they are true disciples. The Father was glorified in the Son's work and now in the believer's work, according to John chapter 13. The lives are the fruit of believers reveal who they are. The present tense, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, present tense, ask and it will be done for you. You know, he's talking about present experience. This present tense underlines the reality of a changed and effective life of love obedience and service. They are the marks of a true believer. We are not saved by our love or our obedience or our service, but they are the evidence that we are believers. The term disciples is used in John's gospel to denote those who are true believers and followers who do God's will and reflect his character. John does not use the term church at all. Therefore, disciples becomes the way he denotes Christian fellowship and gatherings. Discipleship is the daily life of the new age lived out in the old age. It is supremely characterized by love, light, obedience, and service. By these, others will know us. They will recognize us as being disciples of the Lord Jesus. So it's very important then that when Jesus says, I am the wine and you are the branches, we understand that what he really means is that we as Christians do not just walk with him. He is within us, in each of us, and in each other, in our community, in those outside our community. Because he has become through his own incarnation, incarnate in every human being. And that means that when we look at each other, we must look at each other the way that he is. When we treat each other, we must treat each other the way we are, not just as solitary individuals 
being nice to one another. We are people who are filled with the life of God in an intimacy that will last for all eternity. And that is why Jesus says, you cannot separate the vine from the branches. You cannot separate the branches from the vine. There is a relationship that it began when we put our faith in Christ and then continue until God has completed his purpose for us. So this is a great mystery because Jesus is saying, you are dependent on me. But he's also saying that God is glorified through our lives. In other words, that God has made himself dependent on us. That's a picture. And may we, by God's grace, rise up to that talent to be fruitful branches of the true one.